I bought the iPad Pro with M1 chip in hopes of a lightweight, fast, and portable multi-purpose device that I could code on. It delivered in almost all areas. Why an iPad in the first place? Well, the number one reason I wanted an iPad was to read coding books. I already have a Kindle and I love it, but reading coding books on a Kindle is a terrible reading experience. In contrast, the large color display is perfect for large code snippets and color syntax highlighting. I definitely don't like reading coding books on my computer, and even though I would prefer physical books, my bookshelves are already maxed out, so the iPad seemed like a good middle ground. The number two reason I was considering an iPad is because Apple announced in their WWDC 2021 keynote that Swift Playgrounds on the iPad would be able to release full applications to the App Store. And since I wanted to learn more Swift and Swift UI, I thought that would be a good opportunity. So I pulled the trigger. What does the iPad do well? Tons of stuff. You can use it for any form of writing, spreadsheets, music production, video editing, drawing, graphics. It's obviously great for media consumption, watching movies, TV shows, and playing video games. It's also super portable, so if you're snuggling with your significant other in bed, you can watch a quick show really easily. People have even made entire movies on the device. It also excels when it comes to things that involve the pencil. Note taking, drawing, photo editing, and most recently, I've used it to edit my YouTube videos in Final Cut Pro. I've been impressed, to say the least. The precision of the pencil and the jog wheel are excellent. What about accessories? Because I planned to code on it, I knew I needed a good keyboard, and I ended up getting the Magic Keyboard. And I have to say, it's really nice. It's expensive, but nice. It acts as a really solid case, and as a keyboard, it works really well. For the most part, I feel like I'm able to use about 80% of my native Mac OS keyboard shortcuts, which is pretty good. Though I wish I could do more complex key remapping with something like Carabiner Elements, you can remap caps locks to escape, which is pretty cool. I wasn't sure how I'd like the new mouse.ui feature that they added to the iPad recently, but after some regular use, it works quite well. While it isn't completely like a Mac OS experience, this goes to show that the iPad still feels like a different device category. All of these small differences add up. Also, the Gen 2 Apple Pencil that connects magnetically and charges to the top of the iPad seemed like an obvious choice. I've been very pleased with the precision and the reliability of the pencil. It's great for taking handwritten notes or sketching out a problem for work. Obviously, it's ideal for system design type whiteboarding questions in practice, even journaling when I'm feeling introspective. The sheer fact that you don't have to awkwardly plug it into the bottom of the iPad is worth the extra $30. What about performance and battery life? Performance is snappy and battery life is excellent. The power and energy efficiency of the new M1 series of chips is top notch. Apple really accomplished something special with the chip transition. I can't wait to see how this improves workflows and also potentially even brings AAA games to the Mac in the near future. For battery life, I can throw it in my backpack, pull it out a few days later, and still have plenty of battery life to get work done. The M1 chipset really did wonders for my battery anxiety, especially when compared with my old work computer, which was a 16-inch Intel MacBook Pro that had one to one and a half hours of battery life when not plugged in. What about portability? This was probably one of the most surprising takeaways for me. I I expected the iPad to be lightweight and very portable, but once you add the accessories, especially the Magic Keyboard, the weight and thickness increases a lot. Check out this side-by-side -side with an M1 MacBook Air. The most notable difference is the weight, which increases by more than double when you add the Magic Keyboard. But this is, in reality, replacing a keyboard and a mouse, so you are saving a ton of space, even though it increases the weight and thickness of the iPad significantly. A trade-off for sure, but also worth it. So how does the iPad fare as a coding device? Does it live up to expectations? Can you code on an iPad? The short answer is yes. The long answer is more complicated. It really depends on what type of coding you'll be doing and what type of development environment you have access to. If you're just learning Swift in Swift Playgrounds, then sure, you can learn to code on an iPad. But you could also do the same thing with the base model iPad for a fraction of the cost. But if you're a sysadmin mainly working in SSH terminals, or if you have access to a browser-based cloud development IDE, then I could see the iPad fitting into your workflow, especially if you want to pair it with an external monitor over USB-C to HDMI. But if you need to run something like Xcode or IntelliJ or WebStorm or VS Code, then it's still pretty much a no-go for now. Given these limitations, the iPad didn't work out for my needs, but I still love you, iPad. Why not buy an iPad in 2023? Aside from the mixed bag regarding coding, here's three more reasons. Number one, it's expensive. After buying a powerful Pro model, a decent keyboard, and a pencil, it ended up being more money than a laptop I could have used for even more coding activities. Number two, the keyboard shortcuts and operating system aren't quite as power user friendly as I would prefer. 
I use a lot of built-in Mac OS shortcuts and not all of them transfer to iPad. Some of my shortcuts don't work because it depends on how the developer coded the app to respond to keyboard shortcuts on the iPad, which can be frustrating. Number three, the screen is quite small. To save on cost, I opted for the 11 inch, but even if I went with the 12.9 inch, it would still be too small for me. I work best with a 15 to 16 inch laptop, and so even though I could add an external monitor, the screen, which I would like to use by itself from time to time, isn't quite big enough for me. So would I recommend buying an iPad in 2023? If you have a good use for it, I'd say sure, but it doesn't really do much more than a base model MacBook Air, so I would consider that first before buying one. If you need it for the artistic pencil-based work workflow, then it's great. Or if you want a multifunctional device that's lightweight, portable, and you can get real work done on, then I would recommend it. If you find this content helpful, please consider liking and subscribing. As always, I'll leave some helpful links in the description, and thanks for watching.